So today I'm going to talk about something that I have struggled with, that you have struggled with. Because when we come tell patients that, hey, look, we want you to do fasting, we want you to exercise, we want you to follow a diet that is low in carbs, uh, and sometimes we are now talking a lot about a low carb, low fat, protein rich diet. You go home, you feel hungry, you feel deprived. And then if at all you are like me, there will be periods in which you will binge eat. And after binge eating, you will have this guilt and sometimes like me can even have some shame. And then you say, well, I don't want to go see this doctor again because I feel I have failed. <laughs> and so I don't want that for, you, for that to happen to you. So that's why embarking on this journey is difficult and it's full of challenges. And the reason I prepared this talk today is to describe what the challenges are for us and, and they're especially very, very hard in this day and age. So my goal today is to help you improve your habits, whether it is food habits, exercise habits, media watching habits, although that's not what I'm going to get into. And in order to do that, I have broken the presentation into several parts. One of them would be called as the understanding our pleasure center. We have a pleasure center in the brain, which is called the hedonic or the dopamine uh, pleasure center. Then we're going to talk about recruiting the power of the close, you know, people who are close to us, like spouses, families, close friends. Then we're going to look at the power of social norms and shaping our habit and doing the right things. And then we will be talking about environment versus willpower. What is more important? Is it better to change your environment or is it better to change willpower? And then we talk about how the habits should change. Should they change from outside in or inside out? And I'll get into that later on. And if we have time, we may go into what is called an implementation intention. So this is our brain center that drives pleasure. So there are several portions in the brain. You don't need to know the names. You can uh, take a look and take a picture of it if you so desire. But this will be coming on YouTube, so I would not even bother taking pictures. But we eat for two reasons. One of them is what is called a homeostatic drive. So a homeostatic drive. I don't know whether I should stay close to the microphone or come up here. Can you guys hear me if I talk from here? Yes. So one of them is called the homeostatic drive to eat. Now this is based on our energy needs. We all need energy for our muscles, for us to function, for us to think. And that is based on a few hormones, leptin, ghrelin, we have talked about that. But that's not why we usually eat. The reason we eat is because we have this pleasure-seeking center, which is called the hedonic brain center, which is based on dopamine. So to go back into history, there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Pavlov, and Pavlov did some experiments in dogs. And what he did was that he showed the dog a slab of meat. And when the dog would see a slab of meat, he would start salivating. So he changed the conditions a little bit, and the next time, before showing the dog the slab of meat, he would ring a bell. So the dog learned to associate the ringing of the bell with the fact that he's going to get a slab of meat. And after some time, it was a response in which he learned that ringing the bell means I'm going to get a slab of meat. And even though he didn't present the slab of meat the next time around, ringing the bell made the dog salivate. So this is what Pavlov did many, many years ago. But now we know the neurobiochemistry behind this, what is happening in the brain. So if I were to take you up onto this slide, and I can show you that the first time the dog is presented with the slab of meat, the dog learns to associate the meat with pleasure. 
And as the pleasure is happening, if you look in the hedonic brain center, you would see that dopamine levels are increasing. So the dopamine levels rose when the dog was first given the meat. But as it learned to associate the bell as a cue to be getting the meat, the dopamine levels went up when he got the cue. So every habit that we have is associated with what is called a cue. So in other words, dopamine is not only making you learn that this food is providing you pleasure, but it's giving you several other responses. And those responses are memory, learning, motor ability. So as soon as that cue happens, you start having pleasure. The dopamine levels go up. So once the dog learned that the bell is a cue for him to get a reward, the dopamine level started going up with the cue and not necessarily with the consumption of that meat. So this panel out here is the same as the previous slide. And it's showing that the dog is getting a cue, the dopamine level is going up. What about if you get a cue and the dog gets no meat? So the dopamine levels go up with the cue, with which gives him pleasure. But the absence of meat, the dopamine levels actually go down. And later you will see that when dopamine levels go down, you are left with a lot of disappointment with dysphoria. So it's important for us to understand that. So here I'm telling you that dopamine is one of the primary hormones. That's not the only hormone that gives us pleasure. Uh, it's, a, it's a protein, actually. It's, a, it's an amino acid polypeptide. Now. There are other hormones like oxytocin, endorphins, which is similar to opioids that give us pleasure, but dopamine, dopamine is probably, probably the primary one. And it's not just responsible for pleasure. It's not just respon responsible for hedonism. It's also responsible, as I said, for you to learn to associate a specific cue, and I'll show you what that cue could be, with the possibility of getting the, in this dog's case, the meat, and also the ability to do certain acts, like motor ability and memory and learning. And perhaps dopamine, once you have learned that, is not as important in terms of actually getting gratification or reward. So, I have a little weakness, and that weakness is this uh, chocolate brudge, uh, this uh, Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie ice cream. So if I'm passing the hospital physician dining room, I get a cue. So it says, hey, what's happening to me? So I get this little cue saying that if I go into the physician dining room and if I open the refrigerator, I can get this. So my dopamine levels start going up. But then I remind myself that there's this crazy cardiologist who tells me not to eat sugar and sweets. <laughs> and I walk away from the dining room, then I get that disappointment. So we talked about this, and it's a repeat slide just to tell you that we eat for homeostatic reasons, and we eat for pleasure reasons, which is hedonism. So there's a very nice YouTube talk uh, by uh, Robert Soplowski, and I think you should look at it. And what he says is that in the beginning, just like we said, and this is a little redundant, and redundancy is important, that in the beginning, when you have not associated a certain substance with pleasure, the pleasure happens when you consume the substance. But once you know that there is a signal, you did some work, and you got pleasure, the dopamine starts rising. The dopamine levels are going up as you get the signal. You do the work, the dopamine is still high, 
But when you get the reward, the dopamine is not there anymore. Now, I put this up here for a reason, because I want you to get into the weeds of it so that you can defend yourself better. So there is a brain center, which is called the hedonic drive center. It is giving you the drive to go out there, the motor ability to seek the reward. And what it does is that it has connections with other brain centers, which is the gratification center. And it releases dopamine, which is picked up by the gratification center receptors and gives you pleasure. But while it is doing that, the dopamine is also giving you all these other things. The cue associated with the pleasure, the motor ability, the learning, and all the factors that you need to do to get that gratification. So here is another redundancy. This was done in rats as well. So these rats, when this light is going on, they know that a reward is coming. And as soon as they see the, uh, the, the light go up, here are dopamine levels. The dopamine levels start rising. The rat knows that when I see that cue, I need to go and press the lever. And when the rat presses the lever, receives a sugar reward. Dopamine levels go up further. In this case, the rat sees the light, presses the lever, gets no reward. Dopamine levels plummet, causing dysphoria. Now, how many of you by now think that, hey, we want to destroy this hedonic brain center. We just don't want it to work. By a show of hands, let's see, who, how, how many of you want to just eliminate the center in the brain? <laughs> so that would be a wrong idea. <laughs> the reason it would be a wrong idea is because experiment, uh, the people have done that. People have taken rats and removed the dopamine neurons from them. So one of the primary drives that make us live and seek out important things, and, and pleasure is an important thing. I want you to have pleasure in the food that you eat. I want you to have pleasure in life. A dopamine deficient rat just sits in one place. The, the mice is sitting just in one place. It doesn't seek out food, even if you place it a few inches away from it. It dies of dehydration and malnutrition very quickly. So this is one of the most important centers in our brain that is helping us live a meaningful, happy life. So we don't want that to go away. But we want to modulate it. We want to control it so that we live better. So, so far, what we have talked about is, and I'll go back to this slide, You get a signal, you do the work, you get the reward. This is happening 100% of the time. In other words, every time you do something, you're getting, you're working, you're pushing a lever, you're going, running up, finding a piece of sugar, so you're getting the reward 100% of the time. But B.F. Skinner, and I don't know if you guys know about B.F. Skinner, he was a very important American psychologist. And what Dr. Skinner did was pigeon experiments that have been used by the food industry, by Las Vegas uh, casino gambling people, to control us. And what he did was that he did a similar experiment in, um, uh, in, in pigeons. And what the pigeons would do is that they would peck on a lever and they would be rewarded with food. So he said, OK, this is happening. But then he said, let me change the experiment. When the pigeon pecks on the food, sometimes he gets the reward. And at other times, he does not get the reward. So in other words, they would peck on it about five times, get the reward five times. And they would peck on it for eight times, and then get no reward. And what he found is that the pigeons went absolutely berserk. They kept pecking and pecking and pecking. And one chicken pecked 87,000 times in a course of 14 hours. 
So this was an experiment that Dr. Skinner did way back before people could insert electrodes in the brains of the pigeon to find out what's happening to them. So when we inserted electrodes in them, now we find that what is happening is that one of the best ways to skyrocket your dopamine levels, the dopamine level is associated with, associated with pleasure, is to give the reward intermittently. Don't give it all the time. Give it sometime, but withhold it sometime. How many of you have put in a Facebook post in which you did something really good? No, nobody uh, does Facebook, OK? And then don't you go back and check and see whether you got any likes? Let's see. You do? OK, so if I told you that the company that manages Facebook is controlling your likes, it's telling you, OK, the more times you check, it's going to hold back your likes so that you come back and check it more and more often because they understand human behavioral psychology. So what was found in neurobiology is that the best way to get somebody hooked is to give the reward 50% of the time. The highest dopamine levels happen when the reward is gotten 50% of the time. So, so far we have talked about a slab of meat, and we got to remember that humans, we have the same brains that our ancestors had perhaps thousands and thousands of years ago, before there was advent of agriculture, food industry, processed food, refined sugar. We used to roam the savanna, and we used to find our own food. And we are susceptible to manipulation of the food industry in a very different way than we think. So Nico Tinbergen was a Dutch biologist, and he wanted to evaluate human behavior. But he said, evaluating human behavior is difficult. Let me first work with herring gulls. So herring gulls are these gulls, and they have a tiny red spot on their beak. And when the herring chicks are little and they are just hatched, the chicks peck on the red spot of their mother when they want food. So they peck on the red spot. So he said, I'm going to create a cardboard beak with a red spot and see if the herring gulls will peck on it. And he thought he's going to be a complete failure because they will, the herring gulls will recognize this as a complete fake and will not peck. And to his surprise, he found that the larger the red spot he put, the more the herring gulls pecked, even though they did not get food. And if he put three red spots, that they would go crazy. <laughs> so what that tells you is that humans are programmed. Animals are programmed with a certain set of behaviors, instincts. And one of the instincts that we are programmed with is to put a high value on sugar especially if that sugar is combined with fat. Now, I will not go into the story, but I have presented the story before. This is the story of a reed wobbler. And uh, well, maybe we will if we can. Um, let me see if I can play this. Oops. I'm afraid of that. Um, so how many of you know that the reed wobbler is what is called a brood parasite. Do you guys know what a brood parasite is? No. So a brood parasite is one. So like, for example, not the reed wobbler, but the cuckoo bird is a brood parasite. What that means is that the cuckoo bird lays the egg, but doesn't hatch their eggs on its own, but gets a surrogate mother to do all the work for them. So. This is a reed wobbler. And what the reed wobbler is doing, so the reed wobbler, uh, when, uh, when the reed wobbler goes away, the cuckoo bird comes in and lays an egg. And the egg of the cuckoo bird is larger than the reed wobbler's eggs. 
So the cuckoo bird, uh, sorry, the reed wobbler will sit more on the egg of the cuckoo bird so that it hatches early. So here is a cuckoo chick that is hatched. And look at the effort it is putting in to throw out the eggs of the reed wobblers, the, her own eggs. So it struggles, and then when the, when the uh, reed wobbler comes in, it opens its mouth big and wide with that pink uh, oropharyngeal area so that the reed wobbler will be forced to feed it more and more. And it was not successful the first time around, but now it gets rid of one of the eggs. So looks like it failed, but just wait, it'll be successful. They're, they're trying its best, best, okay. Still, still not, but look at the effort of the reed wobbler in getting rid of that egg. I mean, sorry, the cuckoo bird's chick in getting rid of that egg. So first egg plops in, the second egg will plop in, the third egg will plop in. But what I'm trying to tell you is that how nature is designed for the reed wobbler to think that the cuckoo bird's chick is its own chick, even though you will see that it looks very different than her own chicks, it looks very different than her. In fact, it becomes so big that within a few weeks, it's bigger than the reed wobbler, but yet, Look at it, there's no similarity, but the reed wobbler is coming in and feeding it quite constantly. So basically, the cuckoo bird is a brood parasite that gives the care of its offspring to a surrogate mother, and here is the cuckoo bird sitting there, and the reed wobbler is coming in and feeding it, wow. even though, and you can see a, a comparison out here. That one is a cuckoo bird's egg, and it'll sit preferentially on that. The other one are reed wobbler's eggs, and it'll not sit on its own eggs. And the reed wobbler is feeding a bird that is almost twice its size. So the reason I put this up is that we are all genetically programmed to value certain stimuli as supernormal stimuli. And the food industry wants to capture and manipulate our minds so that we are hopelessly ad addicted and there is no ethical czar. The, the food industry does not have a czar that says, hey, you're doing something wrong for the population. And if you take a ba bag of Dorito chips, they have a variable hotness index. So just like the rats that get dopamines, uh, that get a positive reinforce sometimes or negative reinforcement, in other words, intermittent positive reward, you take one chip, it'll have slightly less hotness, you take the second chip, it'll have a little bit more hotness so that you will finish the entire bag. There is a whole food industry that is designed to make sure that the prego sauce has the right combination of sugar, salt, and flavor so that you would consume it and Ben and Jerry's has the right kind of combination so that I and Dr. Byrne, and he went away, are hooked to that Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie <laughs> that is present in our, uh, in our uh, hospital dining room. So what I wanted to tell you is that technological, technological advances, manipulation by the food industry, the supermarket, the personal refrigerator and pantry, these are all super normal stimuli for us to increase our food intake that our ancestors did not have. So we have unfortunately been programmed to overeat because we evolved in an era of scarcity. Our brain evolved in an era of scarcity, not in an era of overwhelming abundance. And nobody can tell me that this sugary fruit, which is also a combination of sugar and fat, is not just highly addictive, but it's a super normal stimuli for us. And I used to think that that's all. I mean, get rid of the sugar, get rid of the fat, and you would eat less. But 10 years of doing this, and we have Chana here and Gabe here, my two NPs that you see, we come across a lot of people who follow our advice. They go in and give up all sugar, they give up all carbohydrates, 
and yet they do not lose weight, yet they are heavy. And so I have learned over time that this food that I recommend you to eat, which is uh, brisket, uh, nicely done chicken, uh, lamb chop, uh, bacon, uh, or that's uh, filet mignon wrapped in bacon. This is not just simple food for us. This is also super normal stimuli. I know I can overconsume this. So I want to get into a little bit about the biology, what's happening in our brain. How is our brain being altered through food addiction? So. Let's get into the weeds. We said that there is a hedonic drive center, which is a center that's making us drive to eat, and then there's a gratification center. We know that the hedonic drive center gives dopamine. The dopamine sits on the dopamine receptors in the gratification center and activates them. Now, I put this slide up for one gentleman who said who would come here and I don't know if he came here or no, but the pleasure from food, let's say, like if, if a mice is given a chocolate, the amount of dopamine that increases, and if you can measure it in some way, it goes up by 55%. If it's given nicotine, it goes up by 150%. Cocaine increases it by 225%. But there's a drug that is used to treat adult attention deficit disorder, or ADD, in children, and that's called methylphenidate or amphetamine, that increases it by 1,000%. So our brain wants to be in what is called balance. It does not want to have too much dopamine at any one time. And if there is too much dopamine, it tries to level the balance. And the reason that happens is because these neurons, these dopamine neurons, have what is called tolerance. If you keep activating them, because they were, act they were supposed to be activated briefly and for short periods of time in human history. But we have gotten so good at pulling our own strings, we have gotten so good at making food highly palatable, abundantly available, that if we keep eating and overeating, like for example, I had a cup of Ben and Jerry's and I say, well, I have this beautiful feeling right now. I want to continue that. And I reach for a second cup. I guarantee you the second cup will not be as enjoyable as the first cup was. The reason for that is that with repeated activation of the dopamine centers, the dopamine neurons shrink in size. They become smaller they release less dopamine. The gratification neurons that are receiving the dopamine, they down-regulate the dopamine receptor, so you don't get as much pleasure. But all the other things that you learned in the process, the cue, that bell, in my case, going through the physician dining room and learning that I can get a reward, those things don't go away. So that's an important point. So what happens is that with repeated stimulation, the amount of dopamine in the pleasure center goes down. And when it goes down, there is not even a tonic level of dopamine. The dopamine levels are lower, and you get dysphoria. So you're going to go ahead and eat, not for pleasure, but just to feel normal. And here is the brain scan. This is the brain scan of somebody addicted to food out here. And this is a brain scan of a normal person. So if I were to ask you how these are the dopamine neurons. And the greater the red is, the more the activation of the dopamine neurons. The dopamine neurons are getting a lot more activated in a normal person than in a food addicted person. It would surprise you that the neurobiology of food addiction is no different than the neurobiology of addiction to drugs. So later, we're going to learn towards the end of this talk 
as to how we can do what is called a dopamine fast. When we do a dopamine fast, we reset the dopamine centers, we get to reestablish enjoyment or pleasure in the food that we consume. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I want to move on to other areas through which we can improve our habits. So I want to tell you the story of a gentleman by the name of Laszlo Polgar. He was a Hungarian gentleman. And he wrote a series of strange letters to Clara, who was a school teacher, saying that, hey, I want you to get on board and be my wife because I want to raise children with you. And I have this idea that how we can raise children who are going to be geniuses. So there was only one thing that Polgar believed in. He said there is no innate talent. It's only hard work and deliberate practice that's going to make somebody successful. So within a few years, the Polgars were parents to three children, Suzanne, Sophia, and Judith. So their house was filled with chess. He said chess is going to be a good way for, a, for them to be successful. So there was chess boards. Uh, children playing chess would be rewarded for doing that. They were praised for it. Chess memorabilia was present. They would talk about different chess grandmasters. They would take careful notes of every game that the children had played with any of their opponents. And within a few years, when Suzanne was about six, she could beat her father. By 12, she was a local champion. By 18, she was coming to become a grandmaster. Sophia did even better. She could beat her father by five. She became a grandmaster by 16. But the best of all was Judith, it's the youngest one. So Judith could beat her father by four years of age. She became a grandmaster at 15 years, four months, earlier than Bobby Fisher. And for 27 years, until she retired, she was the best woman tennis uh, best woman chess player in the world. So the way Polgars did it is by creating an atmosphere in the family, in, in their close family and close friends of an environment for chess. And I don't know if you know somebody called Magnus Carlsen, but Magnus Carlsen was the reigning world champion. And here is Judith Polgar after retirement playing a game, a blitz game, and defeating Magnus Carlsen. And so uh, whoever, how many, how many of you are interested in chess? And if you're interested in chess, go and watch that game. That game is one of the most wonderful games that you can see, and it's, it's there on YouTube. So first is that I told you, hey, there is this hedonic brain center that's being manipulated both by you and by the industry, and how you can repair it. Now I'm telling you that, hey, Harness the power of your family. Create an atmosphere where you are rewarded for the right food choices. In other words, your, your, your husband and wife, the, spa, the couple, the children, the close friends can create an atmosphere in which food, fasting, exercise is rewarded. And the more proximate these people are, the more likely it is that the whole group will be successful. There are studies after studies that show that if one partner loses weight, about one third of the time, the other partner loses weight. So that was the second aspect. Now let's talk about third aspect. There's something called social conformity. There was a gentleman, another psychologist by the name of Samuel Ash. And he did some amazing experiments. And he said, I want to see how social norms dictate what a person does. And what he did was, it was a very simple experiment. He would show the participant a line. And he'd give another card that say, match the line to the line that is there. And of course, all of you can clearly see that it is the C line that matches that line, right? All of you agree with that. But the experiment was a little bit different. 
So the person who was being tested would come into the room, which is here, and there would be a group of actors who were asked to give scripted answers. And that person did not know that the other people were a group of actors. So in the beginning, they would do a few trials, and everybody would get the right answer, get the hang of thing, and say, hey, I'm going to, this is easy. I'm going to select the right answer. I'm going to get $5 for participating in the study, and then I'm going to go home. But after a few tries, the players in the room were asked to give a wrong answer. OK? So what do you think that the test subject would do at that time? He would see that other people are giving the wrong answer. And what do you think that the test subject would do? 75% of the time, they gave the answer of the group. Because humans are herd animals. We want to be wrong to belong to the group. Now, if there was only two people in the room, then the person would think that I'm dealing with a dummy, and they would always give the right answer. It required at least three people or more. The more the number of actors who knew the ruse of giving the wrong answer, the more social conformity happened. So I want you guys to use this human failing or, or weakness or power and harness it to your own benefit. This is the month of Ramadan. And I can tell you, you know, being a Muslim myself, although I don't practice the fast, that's one of the most difficult things to do. You wake up in the morning, so it will be like these days, it will be like around 6.20 or 6.30. You cannot eat after that. You cannot drink water after that. And you would break your fast at approximately 8 p.m. So that's 14 hours. In summertime, it can be as long as 18 hours. But you would be surprised that the power of social norms makes many Muslims around the world go and do this fasting for 30 days every year. That is the power of social norms. I want you to harness that. Belong to a group. This group is good. I mean, one of the reasons I want you to come here is to find a community. If you're trying to do this on your own, it's much harder. But when you belong to a community, like a, a low-carb diet group, a fasting group, an exercise group, like for example, I belong to a cycling group. And the cycling group gives me the kind of motivation to be a better cyclist. The power of my friends and competitors in me showing up is a lot more than if I had been doing it all on my own. So I want you guys to create groups, harness the power of social norms that Samuel Ash showed it to us. Now let's move on to another aspect through which you can improve your habits. How many of you guys think that Willpower and motivation is the most important way to improve your health. I like that laugh. <laughs> so this is work of a, a, a lady, a physician at Massachusetts General Hospital by name, Ann Thorndike. Ann Thorndike said, I can change the eating habits of people who come to the hospital cafeteria and patients without even talking to them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to give them any instructions, but I'm going to change their eating, eating habits. All she did was go to the cafeteria and redesign the cafeteria. So out here in these gray boxes, the, here's the cashier. These are the gray areas where soda, soda is available. That's uh, soda pop. That's Pepsi and Diet Coke and other kinds of Cokes. So she said, I'm going to remove it from here and replace that with water. The soda was still available in the primary refrigerators. But then just she redesigned the environment. When she did that, 
Soda sales went down by about 15%. Water sales went up by 25%. So I want to tell you that I want you to redesign your environment. Go into your pantry. Throw out all the junk food. Give it to your enemies. <laughs> Get into your fridge and remove Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie. <laughs> But so what I'm saying is that redesigning your environment is a lot more important for you to improve your habits than to use willpower, which is in short supply, especially towards the end of the day, and you cannot count on motivation. There's a gentleman, if you uh, Google, by name B.J. Fogg, who talks about habits, tiny habits, and he likes to eat popcorn. So he says, in order for me to reduce the popcorn use, I take my popcorn, and I put it in the garage on the top shelf. So in order to get that popcorn, I have to take a ladder, climb up to the popcorn. So he creates enough resistance between him and the popcorn so that he may not consume it as much. So I want you guys to think and harness the power of your environment, redesign your pantry, remove sugar, chips, cookie, get rid of ice cream, keep meat, eggs, chicken, fish easily available so that you can see it right away, that you can, you can cook those replace soda with water. OK, so this is a slide that came into a wrong situation. OK, now this is what is called an implementation intention. And I'm actually doing good with time. And I could have included one other trick, which I'll probably get into uh, in a bit. So there is something called implementation intention. You're going to go from here. You've heard a motivational talk. I hope this is motivational. And you're going to say, I'm going to change everything. So the experimenter said, what is the benefit of a motivational talk? Is it really effective? And sadly, it's not effective. So if you're hearing this from me, and most likely, it's not going to make much of a difference. Unless you do what is called an implementation intention. So you, th this researchers took uh, about 250 people and divided them into three groups. To one group, they said, exercise is good for you, exercise. To the second group, they said, exercise is good for you, and here are the reasons why. It improves your heart health, it improves your cholesterol quality, it makes you lose weight. They were given pamphlets and materials to support that. To the third group, the same presentation was given, the same material was given, but they had to take a piece of paper and write, I'm going to exercise for 20 minutes on this day, at this time, and in this place. So they had to write it down. Which group do you think was successful? What about the second? They got the motivational talk. No difference between the first and the second group. 30, 35 to 38%, 91% of people <coughs> in the last group. When you do an implementation intention, it's likely to be successful. Now, I'm a little bit on tenuous grounds here, and I think that this is a very important thing that I want you guys to understand, is that habits can change your identity, and your identity can change your habits. So it can happen both ways. But most of us, Try to change the habits the wrong way. By the way, all this information, a large portion of this information, you can get from several books. One of the books that I have used here is what's called Dopamine Nation. A second book that I have used out here is called Atomic Habits. And I have tried to give credit to these authors, but these are two wonderful books. So when we try to change a habit, we start the wrong way. We have what is called outcomes-based habit. I want to lose weight. So you are looking at an outcome. So that's an outcome-based habit. The other way would be a process-based habit. A process-based habit is saying that I want to eat low-carb diets. That's the process through which I can achieve my goal. But the best way that James Clear argues for you to make a habit change is what is called an identity change. You change your beliefs 
that you are a healthy person. And by being a healthy person, you're changing your habits based on your identity and your beliefs and not based on outcomes and process. I can give you a simple example. So a person is offered a cigarette and that person refuses saying that, no thank you, I'm trying to quit. That person is still thinking that I'm a smoker, but I want to quit. That same person can have a different attitude when a cigarette is offered and say, no thank you, I'm not a smoker. There he's had an identity change. Same thing here for us. You go to a party, you're offered soda, you say, look, I don't want soda because I'm trying to lose weight. On the other hand, you can say, I don't want soda because I don't drink soda. That's your identity. So this is the story of uh, Dr. Tro. Dr. Tro is a, is a physician that I admire. He's in New York. He's got a podcast. He runs a clinic for, to help people lose weight. He was that heavy. And initially, through motivation and willpower, he started something, which is fasting, exercise, and a diet free of sugar and processed food, and he became very thin. However, you have to recognize that that person out there on, the, on my right, your left, is very different than the person out there. And now, his identity is that of a thin person. And when you identify yourself as a thin person, you will fight tooth and nail to protect that identity. You don't need to work on outcomes-based or process-based. It is who you are, and you're going to fight to protect yourself. OK, so uh, I don't think I'll have the time to go into what is called a streak, but I wanted to tell you how you can do a dopamine fast. Right? There's still some time. Is that okay if we finish at seven? We have got still seven minutes. So a dopamine fast, would it surprise you that exercise improves your dopamine neurons? So I will show you evidence for that. Would it surprise you that there is no real great data that intermittent fasting improves your dopamine neurons, but I think it does? But there's a lot of data for the third thing, which is that taking ice cold showers, and I don't subscribe to that at all because I think there are some dangers of doing that. But I left it out there that there are ways, there are people out there who take ice cold baths and, and drop themselves into freezers that are uh, <laughs> below freezing so that they can improve their dopamine levels. So this is a very important study and it has actually been transformational for me. So these groups, took a group of rats and gave them highly palatable food combining sugar and fat and made them fat. So these are, they are obese right here. And they took these obese rats and they said, we're going to divide them into a group that's exercising, the treadmill group, and the no exercise group. So the treadmill exercise group, they did eight weeks of treadmill exercise. So there's a rat treadmill, you'll be surprised to know. <laughs> and at the end of that time, they monitored their weight their insulin resistance, their brain dopamine levels. And one of the most important things in our brain is that our brain is very sensitive to insulin. Insulin is very important for our brain. If insulin is working well, we form memories, we form connections, we, our cognition is better. So this is the period of time in which they are being overfed and becoming obese. At 12 weeks, they are being divided into an exercise group and to, into a group that is just sedentary. You can see that there was weight loss. As soon as they started exercising, the obese exercise group had weight loss. It was not just weight loss alone, but you could see that they lost weight in the right place. They lost visceral fat. They lost fat in their liver, in their pancreas, and in their heart. Their insulin sensitivity improved. HOMA IR is an indication that insulin is working better. The lower the insulin, the, the lower the HOMA IR, the more insulin sensitive they are, and they improve their insulin sensitivity. 
That means insulin is working better. Their plasma glucose levels, their sugar levels went down with exercise. Now, this is levels of dopamine. So this is their basal levels of dopamine here. At this point, they're being given a treat. Milk is apparently a good treat for the, for the mice. And they were given milk for 15 minutes. This is the normal group, the lean exercise group. This is the green is the obese exercise group. The red one is the obese group without exercise. Who is getting an increase in dopamine levels? So you can see that the obese exercise group actually had an increase in their dopamine levels in the brain centers because there were electrodes that they were monitoring the dopamine levels. So here is dopamine levels. You can clearly see the green group, the obese exercise group, had higher dopamine levels compared to the obese group alone. And this slide shows that insulin receptor through which insulin functions well is higher. This is signaling inside the cell of insulin, which is called, you don't have to remember that, PATK, PAKT, which is higher. And these rats were better able to synthesize glycogen. In other words, convert sugar to glycogen rather than leave it in the bloodstream. So this is summarizing that with exercise, you had more insulin receptors, you had better signaling of the brain, you made more glycogen, didn't leave sugar out in the bloodstream alone, and that your dopamine levels in the pleasure dopamine centers increased. So what are my conclusions? My conclusions are that our pleasure center, our hedonic brain center, is designed for an environment of scarcity. Repeated stimulation with overconsumption of sugary, fatty food is going to lead to the destruction of that center and pain and anhedonia, and you're gonna to have to eat even to feel normal. That exercise for sure and intermittent fasting can repair your hedonic brain center. I want you to remember the story of Las Laszlo Polgar because that way you can harness the power of your family and close friends. I want you to remember the story of Samuel Ash and social conformity so that you can belong to a group where your desired behavior is the normal behavior of the group. If I wanted to make sure that I would fast for sure, I would belong to a Muslim group that is practicing fasting. Because the power of social norms is a, is a lot. I think that it's important to change your identity, so you should have identity-based habits. And then the last important thing that I told you is that I want you to go home and write down an implementation intention. I'm going to start this at this time and in this place. That's the only way we're gonna be successful. So I keep learning, I'm gonna say I'm not perfect. And every time I see people, patients, individuals, I learn from you. And because I'm learning from you, I'm able to pass this information back. So thank you for coming today and I hope it was useful.